I'm Christopher Mitchell, and today I'm going to be discussing using one-sided RDMA reads to build a fast, CPU-efficient key-value store, a work that I created with uh, Yifeng Gang and Jin Yang Li at New York University. So if you look up data center and supercomputer on Google Images, uh, excuse me for a second, minor technical difficulties. you'll get these two among the top images. And they look surprisingly similar. Uh, both have ranges of commodity computers. But a few years ago, that was not quite the case. Uh, supercomputers tended to have special built hardware that was uh, connected by high-speed interconnects. And these days, the main difference between supercomputers and data centers is indeed still the interconnect. Everything else is largely the same. Data centers tend to use uh, commodity Ethernet, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with, to connect the many machines in the data center, whereas supercomputers use high-performance computing networks. Uh, one of these is InfiniBand. And among InfiniBand's features are extremely low latency, uh, 10 microseconds or less, compared to an order of magnitude or worse for Ethernet. Um, the ability to bypass the kernel or even the CPU by performing remote direct memory access, which drastically reduces the CPU load. And finally, uh, extremely high throughput. Uh, InfiniBand offers 40 gigabits per second with today's hardware. So are HPC networks viable for the data center? We decided that this is no longer a pipe dream. In fact, when we went to upgrade our research cluster about a year and a half ago, we were very shocked to learn that InfiniBand was actually cheaper than upgrading to 10 gigabit Ethernet. Um, we found that our 20 gigabit per second cards were $500 compared with $300 to $800 for 10 gig Ethernet cards. And the switches were also surprisingly cheap, $2,700 for a 48 port switch, which is much cheaper than what you could get for a 10 gig Ethernet link. At the same time, Ethernet is starting to embrace InfiniBand-like features. For example, um, there is a proposal called iWarp that brings remote direct memory access to Ethernet. And there are several proposals to reduce Ethernet's latency, among other things, by bypassing the kernel. Uh, you'll hear another talk about that topic during this conference. We think that future data center networks will incorporate networks, will incorporate features uh, similar to what you see in today's high performance computing networks, namely low latency, high throughput, and low cost. And these features are going to bring some new opportunities for system designers that aren't realized in today's systems. Most of the systems that are made today are written with Ethernet's limitations in mind. For example, they uh, limit the number of round trips necessary to complete an operation, since round trips are expensive in Ethernet. They offload most of the processing to the server. And they use a request-reply abstraction, since Ethernet offers message passing and not a whole lot else. In order to use these new networks that are going to be available, uh, we need to think about how systems can be redesigned to take full advantage of all these new features. And to ground our analysis, we looked into creating a key value store. Uh, we don't know what network is going to be available, whether it's going to be InfiniBand or Ethernet with these new features or something that hasn't been created yet. But we used InfiniBand as a proxy for our system to show how these new features can be used. So now that I've given you a prologue that motivates why we created our system, I'm going to move on to what PILAF is. I'll start with our basic design. I'll look at how we solve races. And I'll also talk about how we improve memory efficiency. I'll conclude my talk with an evaluation that compares PILAF to uh, similar systems, such as Memcached and Redis, both of which are widely used as in-memory key value stores. So let's look at the design of PILAF, a fast, CPU-efficient key value store. Today's key value stores are insufficient for the needs of the near future. For example, they have high latency. Uh, a recent NSDI paper from Facebook quoted a 75%, a 75 percentile latency of one millisecond for memcached D operations. And if a web page requires 50 dependent, non-parallelizable gets to build the page, and that's realistic given that Facebook talked about hundreds of operations to build some pages, then this is already 50 milliseconds just to create the page. 
we think this is unacceptably high. Uh, today's key value stores also incur relatively high CPU overhead. With today's processors, memcached can only process 50 to 100,000 operations per second. And uh, the effort required to improve this is immense. Facebook talked about you putting in many men years of effort to get only an 8 to 400% improvement on memcached operations. The system that I'm going to show you today gets a, an order of magnitude or better improvement across all operations. So how can InfiniBand help? Obviously, if we're going to take advantage of InfiniBand, we can't just use the fact that it has more throughput than Ethernet. We have to take advantage of some of its new features. So first, we look at how we can use uh, RDMA, Remote Direct Memory Access, which bypasses the CPU entirely. By allowing nodes to directly read and write a remote machine's memory, these operations incur zero CPU overhead on the remote machine, which is a big win. Secondly, we have ultra-low latency operations on the order of three microseconds. This means that uh, round trips are no longer prohibitively expensive, and it's, we can create operations that need multiple round trips to complete without incurring any significant latency. In order to understand how we can improve a key value store, I think I have a disconnection. In order to understand how we can improve a traditional key value store, we have to first figure out how it works. So a traditional key value store, as shown here, has a client connected to a server, and the server is responsible for fulfilling both get and put operations. When the client sends a get request, the server will fetch the requested data from its local memory and return it to the client. When the client requests a put operation, the server is responsible for writing its local memory. The server's memory is therefore opaque to the client. The client doesn't know anything about the structure of that memory. One way that we can use InfiniBand to improve our key value store is by using RDMA, potentially allowing clients to perform all operations remotely. We can have clients write put requests directly to the server's memory, and we, have client, we can have clients directly read uh, hash table entries and key values from that memory. Of course, now the client has to be aware of the exact structure of the server's memory. Here we have a hash table with fixed size entries, uh, each of which points into some extents area to uh, provide the key and value for that particular entry. Although clients can theoretically directly read and write the server's memory via RDMA, we don't think that it's a good idea to use this uh, because um, there will be complications from it. Therefore, our very first design choice was to have clients perform read-only operations via RDMA, namely gets, while using traditional message passing for put operations, which uh, offloads uh, puts to the server as done tr in traditional systems. Um, the Design is therefore much better than having clients perform both reads and writes because we won't have to deal with any synchronization between the clients and the server. Uh, we won't have to worry about things like distributed malloc, which could be a mess in and of itself. Um, we don't have to work out a locking scheme between clients and between the client and server. So let me first show you how PLOF's get and put operations work, and then I'll show you how they can fail. So for a get operation, we need at least two round trips because now we're using RDMA and the server CPU is no longer in the loop for these operations. The first thing that's going to happen is the client needs to perform an RDMA read operation to read an entry out of the server's hash table. All of these entries are fixed in size, so the client can deterministically know where in the hash table it needs to look for a particular entry. It will then perform a second RDMA read to read the extent pointed to by that hash table entry. Uh, after it does so, it can check the key, and if that's not the correct key, it might have to fetch another hash table entry as required of all hash tables. If it's the correct entry, then the operation terminates and it has the value. The put operation requires only a single round trip since it uses traditional message passing. The client sends a put request to the server the server is then responsible for reserving memory in the extents, copying the key and value into that new extent, and pointing the hash table to that new memory. 
It'll then return a reply to the client to let it know that the operation is complete, and the client can then uh, proceed with other operations. However, we run into problems here with read-write races. A read-write race will occur when a server is simultaneously performing a local write of its hash table or extents memory, while one or more clients is simultaneously reading that memory via RDMA. There is no way to synchronize these accesses. The InfiniBand card offers atomic operations, and of course the server's CPU has atomic memory primitives, but there exists no memory, uh, no mechanism to synchronize the card with the CPU, so it's impossible to write a coherent locking scheme. I will show you exactly how these races happen, and I'll show you a way that we can solve it without having to worry about any kind of synchronization. So to give you an example of a read-write race in action, I have two clients, client A and client B, both of whom are connected to a PLOF server. And that server has some memory containing that hash table that you've seen so far and the extents to store keys and values. First, client B, which is trying to get uh, a key value from the extents, in this case, uh, the value of the key shoes, uh, performs an RDMA read to get the hash table entry corresponding to shoes. After it does so, but before it performs its second RDMA read to read the actual memory, client A issues a put request to the PLOF server, instructing it to change the value for the key shoes. The PLOF server will then uh, reserve a new area of memory in the extents because the new value doesn't fit inside the memory it had been previously using for that key. It'll update the hash table entry to point to that new memory, and then let client A know that that operation is complete. Uh, indeed, it can even end up processing other requests before client B gets around to performing its second read, so that memory could either be stale or even overwritten. Client B will then get around to performing its second RDMA read, except that now it'll be reading some arbitrary memory contents that were not what it should have been getting. Um, and it'll have no way of knowing whether those memory uh, contents are correct or not. So the problem here is that with concurrent writes, clients can no longer re reliably uh, traverse the server's data structure in the face of concurrent writes from the server's own CPU. This is a specific easier to solve synchronization problem than general uh, read-write races because all we have now are, uh, sorry, general read-write or write-write races. All we have now are read-write races, which we can simply detect. If we detect read-write races at the client, clients can reissue their requests and there will be no incorrect state. So the way we do this is we use self-verifying data structures. Uh, these self-verifying data structures are composed of two components. First of all, we protect the root of our data structures with checksums. Secondly, we protect any pointer within the data structures with a checksum over the uh, intended memory that the pointer references. This means that if any, these, the combination of these two mean that if any data in the system changes while a client is traversing the data structure, it'll be aware of that and it'll be able to restart its operation. So in PLOF, we use these self-verifying data structures concretely by first protecting uh, all of our hash table entries with a CRC. And we can actually think of each hash table entry as a data structure root of itself. Uh, each hash table entry is of a fixed size. And when clients connect to the PLOF server, they're told where that hash table uh, lies and how big it is. So if we assume that each of those uh, hash table entries is a data structure root and protect it with a checksum, the second tier is that we uh, put pointers into those hash table entries pointing into the extents, except that now we protect all those pointers with an additional CRC over the memory contents. So here we have the key and value uh, checksummed and that checksum stored in the hash table entry along with its pointer. So the way that we use these self-verifying data structures during get and put operations is that first, when clients connect to the PLOF server, they have to get the uh, address and size of the hash table and the extents. Then when they perform any get operation, they will uh, read a hash table entry or a key value extents and then check the CRC associated with that memory to make sure that the memory they read was the correct 
contents. Uh, if the server needs to resize either the hash table or the extents, it will disconnect all clients until the resize is complete, which serves two purposes. First of all, this makes sure that no clients will be performing RDMA operations while the server is in the midst of resizing things, so we don't need any additional synchronization to block clients from performing those RDMA operations. And secondly, it ensures that when clients reconnect after the resize, they will have updated information about the new location and size of the hash table and extents, which is important to guarantee that these self-verifying data structures will still function properly. So here's how we then combine our previous PLOF design with these self-verifying data structures to detect read-write races and prevent invalid data from being returned to whatever is using PLOF. First, our client fetches the entry from the hash table for a particular key, as it has been doing so far, except now the hash table entry that it fetches contains not only a pointer, but also a checksum over the data that the pointer refers to as well. As before, we then have other clients connected to the server requesting that the server update the value for this particular key. The server reserves a new area of memory for the new value and writes it in. And in this case, it also happens to uh, accept a put operation that causes the old memory to be overwritten by part of Lincoln's Gettysburg address. So then when the client goes to read that memory that it had originally read a reference to in the hash table, it will get what is now completely corrupt contents. Since we had a checksum over the original contents, when it goes to compare the checksum of the new data it fetched with the checksum stored in the hash table, it will see that there's a mismatch, and it knows it needs to go back, reread the hash table entry to get the new pointer, and then proceed with the operations as normal. Our third design choice uh, is a little bit orthogonal to the issue of high-performance networking features, but it was still important to build an efficient system. Uh, it's a fairly well-known fact that in any hash table design, as the fill level of the hash table increases, the number of probes required to find a particular piece of data also increases. Uh, here, we've experimentally tested two different designs. On the x-axis, you can see the uh, fill ratio of the hash table, in other words, what percentage of its entries are filled with a key. And on the y-axis, which is logarithmic, the number of probes necessary for uh, finding any key in the best, worst, and average case. With linear probing, uh, you can require up to 200 or more probes at a 75% fill level, which we found to be uh, too high, even with InfiniBand, where round trips are relatively cheap. 200 round trips would mean uh, 600 microseconds at three microseconds per round trip. With three-way cuckoo hashing, which is the alternative that we chose, there's a strict constant upper bound on the number of probes necessary to find any key or determine that that key is definitely not in the hash table, in this case, three. Finally, we implemented a failure recovery design that involves asynchronously logging all put requests to SSDs. Uh, this means that if we have a crash, all we need to do is replay those puts to regain the state of the server. We found that there was no performance reduction unless we reached the capacity that the SATA link or the SSD could process. Uh, we can solve this by simply increasing the number of SSDs or using faster SSDs. So now that I've given you a thorough overview of uh, how PLOF is put together, let me talk about how it performs, especially compared to Redis and Memcached. We built PLOF in C++. We tested it over a cluster of machines connected with 20 gigabit per second InfiniBand. And we ended up using CRC64 because it, guaranteed, it gave us a theoretical collision rate of once every 500 millennia compared to CRC32, which would have collided once every hour at our maximum throughput. In order to evaluate PLOF's success, we had to ask three main questions. First, we had to determine if PLOF is fast. Secondly, because one of InfiniBand's advantages is that it can bypass the CPU, uh, we uh, tested whether PLOF does indeed save CPU cores. Finally, we tested uh, if self-verifying data structures are successful in uh, efficiently and effectively detecting races. PLOF has high throughput. 
So we tested against uh, Redis and Memcached, first over Ethernet and then over IP over InfiniBand, which is InfiniBand's system for allowing Ethernet uh, uh, applications to operate without any modifications. Our Ethernet uh, results were actually a little bit lower than our IP over IB results, so we didn't show them here. The most important takeaway is that Pilaf was able to achieve over 1.3 million operations per second from a single server CPU core. Uh, by comparison, Redis and Memcached achieved 55 to 60,000 operations per second. We tested with the YCSB benchmark, and we used a workload consisting of 90% gets, 10% puts, which Facebook's NSDI paper indicated was realistic for a real world workload. We also tested with 50% puts and 50% gets, and we were surprised to find that our performance was actually even better. It turns out that our InfiniBand cards can satisfy a significant fraction of their maximum uh, message passing and RDMA throughput simultaneously. We also wanted to make sure that PLOF's advantages are from RDMA, not just from InfiniBand's throughput. So we created a version of PLOF called PLOF VO, which uses the uh, verbs messages, which is InfiniBand's message, message passing capacity for both get and put operations. You can see that using uh, message passing instead of RDMA for gets reduces our maximum throughput by more than a factor of two across a range of value sizes from 64, to, uh, one kil 64 bytes to one kilobyte. PLOF is also very fast. Uh, here we graph the latency of PLOF and Redis and Memcached operating over IP over IB. The 99% latency for PLOF is 45 microseconds, whereas uh, the 99% latency for Memcached and Redis is above 300 microseconds. We checked that our self-verifying data structures are both effective and efficient in uh, detecting races. We found that they are indeed effective in uh, detecting races, and we were able to get no incorrectly missed collisions during our tests. And in this graph, we artificially limited the size of the number of unique keys being accessed and found that even with extremely uh, low number of unique keys, which is unrealistic in a real system, the uh, collision rate was reasonable. So to sum up our evaluation, three important numbers. First, the maximum throughput we were able to achieve was 1.3 million operations per second on a single CPU core. Secondly, uh, to match this throughput, Redis and Memcached would require 17 to 23 times as many cores, uh, even with perfect linear scaling. And finally, PLOF's latency is 9 to 15 times lower than Redis and Memcached. So to conclude, a few lessons from building PLOF. Our goal was to show that high-performance computing features will be effective in the data center, since we believe that these high-performance networking features will be available in the data center in five to 10 years. We found that uh, InfiniBand's RDMA feature was indeed effective in creating new systems. And we decided that combining RDMA for read-only operations with traditional message passing for uh, write operations gives the best balance of both simplicity and performance. Uh, we also found that our self-verifying data structures are efficient and effective for detecting uh, read-write races. And we found that they are simple enough to be reused in any similar or more complex system. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions at this point. When you found FermiLab, a question. And for the RDMA, you need a lossless network. So is the package job in considering your, in your work? Uh, no. We use the reliable transport mechanism that InfiniBand offers, so we didn't have to worry about those problems. Are you using, using the InfiniBand, not the Ethernet? Yes. Okay, thank you. Abel Gordon from IBM Research. So my first question is regarding if you, are, if you, have, if you have look into transactional memory support in new Intel processors, if they have, if this support can actually help you to, to improve all the consistency issues? I'm not aware that that would offer any help, but I haven't looked very deeply into it. Okay, and second question related to the connection that you are creating now between the client and the server. Mm -hmm. Now the client is exposed to the implementation of the server. Correct. Right, so if we, for example, I would like to upgrade the server because I 
change the implementation, I will now need to maybe update all my clients. That's right? true. Uh, although it won't be that big of a deal because we envision this as perhaps a lower level under some more complex system. So you would only have to replace this very low level that is aware of the server's memory structure, and that could simply pass up values and accept values from a higher level. Okay. Hey, uh, it's Joel Dirson from ETH Zurich. I also have two short questions, if that's okay. Uh, the first is, uh, so you were speaking of CRC for checking if you know the, the content changed, but uh, what I, I didn't get is if you get back the, the key and the value, you can actually, you have to check the key, right? I mean, on the client, you're comparing the key that you're looking up with the key that you got back from the hash table. Correct. So why is the CRC still necessary in this case? Because the key, if we simply move the pointer, but the old memory didn't get overwritten, there's no guarantee that the key would have changed. It might still be at that old location, but just be stale. And the value might have gotten overwritten while the key might not have. It's OK. Uh, and the other thing is about cuckoo hashing. So uh, you were speaking of the approach that you take for resizing the, the, first, the first approach with the hash table. And then basically disconnecting everybody on, until you finish resizing. Now Correct. with cuckoo hashing, resizing is is much more expensive than with, with your first hash table approach, right? So how do you how how much do you think this is actually disruptive for a normal operation? So cuckoo hashing has two kinds of sort of resize operations. One there's the cascading kickout operation, uh, which we don't disconnect clients for. We look forward through memory to see where that kickout is going to happen and then work backwards along the chain, meaning that each piece of data will be in two locations at the hash table while it's moving data around. So there's no need to disconnect clients for that. Uh, for resizes, we simply disconnect clients as we normally would. And we didn't find that there was a significant increase in resizing times between linear probing and cuckoo hashing. OK, thank you. Hi. I'm Mario Sielenbrand from Karlsruhe. I also have a question about your hashing, your okay. hash table. You stated that linear probing, um, you run into problems. Yes. The, because you have you get to do too many round trips. Um, once you are initiating a remote EMA read, you could just go ahead and read several hash table entries. So say from the InfiniBand MTU of 2K, um, you would get a couple of hundred hash table entries at one size. Have you to add at one round trip, have you tried that? We did indeed investigate that, getting larger chunks of key values. But we found that the additional time necessary for transferring that larger chunk of data uh, made it not as advantageous as just switching to cuckoo hashing mm -hmm. fully taken over. OK, and uh, do we have any ideas of how to handle write operations? Um, so you mean having clients handle yes. write operations? Yeah, we investigated all the different ways it could be done. And we theoretically could use something like lock-free data structures to allow it to be used. But the complexity of that system would have been so much higher than what we were able to achieve with uh, performance that we don't believe would be markedly better, especially since realistic real-world workloads tend to be read-heavy. So we decided our approach was the best balance of simplicity and performance. OK, thank you.